Hi folks, I'm Kelly. Welcome back to Unpacking the Trunk Costumes. Today's video is my response to the World War II Sewing Challenge, which is hosted by Thistle and Stitches, Sew Biased, and the Vintage Guidebook. The challenge was to create a garment based on rationing guidelines presented to civilians during World War II. I read over the guidelines and found them interesting, but knowing me, I wanted to put an Alaska spin on this. I didn't find much in my research because what was going on in Alaska is what was going on around the rest of the country, except with slightly different environment and access to supplies. So I thought about Alaska's history and what was going on prior to World War II, and that is where my project found its footing. In 1935, in the heart of the Great Depression, 202 families in the Midwest were recruited to travel to the Matanuska Valley just north of Anchorage, Alaska to colonize the area and start new farms. Many of these families were of Northern European descent, and it was thought that their heritage would help them endure the climate of Alaska. This federal project was run by the government under the Alaska Rural Rehabilitation Corporation. Each family was given 40 acres to clear, with a loan of $3,000 to be paid back at the end of 30 years. They would be given a home and a barn, some farm implements, and some livestock. Many did their best to make a go of it, and the success of the Matanuska Valley's farms today is a testament to the hard work and determination of those early colonists. I'm not going to be able to tell you the whole history of this time, but I do have several recommendations for you that are linked below. If you'd like to learn more about this little known and fascinating period of U.S. history, I've linked my playlist below. It includes many videos full of photos and excellent facts about this story. The one video I recommend above all is called Alaska Far Away. This is a long video that you can purchase or rent and include the, the stories, photos, and interviews with many of the original colonists. I'd like to personally thank Sherry Hamming, the president of the Palmer Historical Society, and their archivist, Carol Lombardo, for their support and encouragement as I worked on this project. It's been such a blessing to get to know them, and I appreciate their passion and dedication to the history of this part of Alaska. My project consisted of a dress and an apron. At the end of the video, you will join me in my kitchen as I make a couple of things I felt Matt Nuska Colony's hardy women would have fixed for their families. I began with the dress pattern. The pattern is from Style Arc, and the dress is called the Armadale dress. It consists of a button front, short sleeves, a slightly higher waist, and a full skirt with pockets. I started by making a muslin mock-up of the pattern so that I could adjust the fit just right, and then I used my mock-up as the pattern pieces to cut out my pretty plaid fabric. I did lengthen the sleeves so that they would come to elbow length on me. And I added a little bit of extra seam allowance to the skirt panels. I placed interfacing on one side of the collar, pinned the uninterfaced side to it, and then ran that through my machine. Once I had the collar sewed, I carefully clipped the curves so that they would lay flat. And 
and then I turned the collar right side out and I pressed it flat. I then top stitched right across the outer edges of the collar. I pinned the bodice back and fronts together at the shoulder seams. I sewed them together off camera and then I pressed open the seams on the shoulders. The next thing I did was to pin the collar to the bodice neckline. And I sewed that on. And of course it was time to press the seam I had just sewed. I'm pinning the side seams of the bodice together and I'm sewing those up. The next step was to sew some long gathering stitches in two places on the fronts of the bodice. I gently gathered those seams together to match the measurements that it called for. I sewed the underarms of the sleeves together And then I sewed a long gathering stitch along the top of the sleeve where indicated on the pattern. I then gathered the sleeve to fit into the arm side. And then I sewed the sleeve into the arm side. No sleeveless this time. Now is time to pin the long skirt sections together. Off camera, I sewed one side of each of the two pockets onto their respective seams of the skirt and here I am pressing those seams. I sewed an edge stitch along the pocket seams so that they would turn in more easily. So here I am going from the top of the skirt, pivoting at the pocket, going down around the pocket, and then sewing again all the way back down the skirt. Next, it was time to attach the bodice to the skirt. So here I am matching the gathers that I had created before in the bodice to the skirt. And then I sewed the bodice and the skirt together. The facing of this garment is a long piece, and um, there's three pieces. It, there's a piece for in the back, around the back of the neck, and then it joins at the shoulders and goes all the way down around the front to the seam. So here I am with the interfaced facing that I had ironed on there, and I'm pinning that to the edge of the dress. Off camera, I sewed the facing on, and here I am pressing the seam toward the dress. Again, I edge stitched very close to the seam I had sewn, 
along the facing line so that the facing would turn more easily toward the inside. I hand stitch the facing down to the dress. With the dress now on the mannequin, and it was fitting me great too, I went ahead and I measured out where I wanted the hem to be. And then I used my chalk pencil, and I used a nice bright red color <laughs> so I could see it. And I measured out from that hemline uh, about an inch or so down from the pins. And then I trimmed that off. And then I hand sewed the hem up off camera. Here you can see a detail of what I did with the sleeve. I made a little Sort of box pleat and I put a pretend button there and I think that turned out really cute. This is an apron pattern I found on Etsy. For, it's called the Ultimate Apron and I love the style of it because it looks an awful lot like uh, what I was seeing in the images of women in the Matanuska colony. So I needed to upsize it just a little bit, which I did, and adjusted it on my mannequin, and, and it all fit really well. So here I am using an old bed sheet, which is super cute, and my cloth pattern from my muslin. I am making a big mistake here. <laughs> um, I am putting the wrong edge of the pattern on the fold. You'll see me get frustrated here in just a second. It worked out and I'll tell you how it worked out. The pieces are all cut sort of in one so the shape is really really weird. The pattern um, is not real good at explaining how it goes together but once you see it on a mannequin or on yourself, it totally makes sense. It just looks really weird at first. Okay, so here's where I realized that I made a mistake. Yep, I cut the, I should have cut the front of the, of the apron on the fold. Instead, I cut it the back on the fold. Yeah, that didn't look quite right. So I fussed with it a bit and really all it took was cutting the back open like it was supposed to be and um, making a seam uh, right down the front and, and joining up the, the two sections of the front. It wasn't a big deal, just a mistake on my part. There we go, I've pinned <laughs> the front back together and now I'm joining up the pieces so that I can see you know sort of what it's gonna look like if if maybe there's parts that are too big or whatever so I just kind of pinned it in place on the mannequin in this scene I am actually doing a French seam um, on that front seam that shouldn't be there um, on the apron I just wanted it to be nice and clean the apron's going to get a lot of use and it's going to get a lot of washes, so I wanted the seam to be good and sturdy. So I did a French seam. And I'm joining the front shoulder pieces together and also the back pieces. In the spirit of making do, I found some bias tape in my stash and I went ahead and used that. Even though it was pretty narrow, I, I what did I do? I made do, that's right. And Maisie decided to come and help. I went ahead and I put the apron on my mannequin. 
There were places in the end where it was a little bit too big, but I can always fix that later. In this scene, I am tying, uh, I'm not tying, I'm pinning on the apron ties where they should be. I made some nice long ones. I love having long apron ties. And here I am trying to figure out where I want the pockets to go. I put two big pockets on the front. The pattern instructions advise to make a double layer pocket for durability and I thought that was a good idea so I went ahead and I did that. And finally, I am pressing my little pocket square open and I am sewing it on to the apron. Hi, welcome to my kitchen. Um, I actually do have a 122 year old kitchen with lots of modern appliances. So what I'm going to do is in my colonist outfit, I'm going to go ahead and make a couple of things that would have been made in the Matanuska Valley colony with the kind of ingredients that they would have had on hand. Mainly I'm going to make really simple things. I'm going to make biscuits first and then I'm gonna make split pea soup. The reason I'm making biscuits is these ingredients are shelf stable and they would have had them on hand. Of course, I'm gonna be using a modern oven. <laughs> I don't have a wood powered oven. Um, I'm also gonna be making split pea soup and we'll talk about that a little bit more later. To save your ears, I am doing a voiceover from here on out. The audio in my kitchen was bad at best. So first I am measuring out four cups of all-purpose flour. Next, I am measuring out two tablespoons of baking powder. Next comes a teaspoon of baking soda and a half a teaspoon of salt. And I mix that together with my nifty pastry whisk. I found that at um, Bob's Red Mill here in Portland, Oregon. Now I'm adding a cup of evaporated milk. This is not sweetened. This is just evaporated milk. Mixing that together. The recipe suggests that you continue to add evaporated milk until the mixture uh, forms a ball and pulls away from the sides. Here I'm adding, uh, looks like a quarter cup of uh, cooking oil, vegetable oil. By this point, I have added almost the entire contents of the evaporated milk can. Uh, I think I had just a little bit left. It's not necessary to knead it, but I was doing that so that it would form a good solid ball. And then you just drop it by spoonfuls onto, I used a parchment lined um, baking sheet, less clean up that way. Put it in the oven and it was in there for probably 12 minutes. And there they are. They look like little mounds. They were a little tough. I mean, they were good. They were a little bit tough, but they were perfect in the soup that I'm going to make next. So now I'm going to be making some split pea soup. Again, this is a hearty meal that would have you shelf stable items like the split dried split peas and also items that the pioneers would have had growing in their own home vegetable gardens. So this is a package of split peas. They've been sitting in water for two hours to soften them up. I'm using some, I think I used three carrots, a couple of potatoes, which the recipe doesn't call for, but I like them, so I'm using them. Uh, half an onion, which again, the recipe didn't call for, but I'm using because I like them, and some celery. I'm cutting up the carrots into little coins. I'm using a tool called an ulu, and I'm cutting on an ulu bowl. An ulu is a, a traditional Alaskan knife, which I 
use all the time and I love for cutting things up. Maisie and Barnaby wanted some carrots. They love carrots. And then I'm using my ulu again to cut up some celery. And I've got yellow uh, Yukon Gold potatoes. I guess that's appropriate, Yukon Gold. Those are my favorite potatoes and I am cutting those into a dice. And again, I'm using the ulu to cut up an onion, half an onion. Here I am rinsing the peas out into a strainer, getting rid of all that liquid. And I run the water through it. And I rinse them a few more times. This is the ham bone that I have saved from, I believe it was New Year's dinner. I have it in my gigantic Lodge cast iron cook pot. I dump all of those peas into the pot. In go the potatoes and the carrots, the celery and the onions. Finally, I'm adding enough water to the soup pot to just cover the vegetables and most of the ham bone. I added some salt and pepper to the broth as well, and I brought it, gave it a good stir and brought it to a boil. Grandma Farrell suggests removing the white foam that comes to the surface after you have been boiling the soup for a while, so I went ahead and did that. Now Grandma Farrell suggested cooking the soup um, 30 minutes. I just let it cook and I, I kept stirring it and checking on it to make sure that the vegetables were soft and they, the house smelled wonderful. The ham bone made a huge difference in the split pea soup. At this point, I have been cooking the soup for about an hour, maybe an hour and a half. I don't remember exactly, but it was sure looking good. And this is after another about 30 minutes, I've removed the ham bone and you can see all the delicious vegetables in there. I let the soup thicken up a little bit more and I kept all of the good vegetables whole in it. And here is the final product. It was absolutely delicious. And with some of those biscuits crumbled up in it, it was even better. That crate that you see in the background is actually from the Matanuska Valley um, Farmers Co-op where they had a dairy farm and this was one of their dairy crates. So those were my three projects. I hope you enjoyed this. I'm going to end this video by reading two quotes that I found in another video that I'd like to recommend that was produced by the same people who produced the Alaska Faraway video project. That video is called Where the Matanuska River Flows and is a several part project that consists of interviews with colonists and colony kids and these two are people who were colony kids. And so I would like you to follow and watch the pictures and listen to the audio of these two quotes. Again, thank you for joining me today. I'm so glad you came and I will see you next time. It was a chance of a lifetime for us. We didn't realize it at the time. We were only this big. We had a chance to be part of something that will never happen again. We all survived. It was an experience that we'll never forget, and we don't want to forget. The people we grew up with, went to school with, to my knowledge, there isn't one of them that has ever been on welfare. We all worked for every damn nickel we got, never got anything free. We had the opportunity to do that, and I'm glad for it. Bill Bowen's Colony Kit. 
I never belonged to any place before. My family moved from place to place and just never belonged to any place. I was always the stray dog, you know. Wherever we went, I was the new kid on the block and I got picked on. I don't remember ever complaining about it because it wouldn't do me any good. But I think Dad knew. So we left Anchorage and we're on our way up to Palmer on the train and Dad started talking and he said, you know, now is your chance. You're starting out even with everybody else. They are going to be strangers in a strange place, just like you are. Now it's up to you to make your friendships without prejudice or precedence. Nobody was related to their grandfather in somebody's eyes, you know. They hadn't always lived in that particular place. It's up to you. And furthermore, the playing field is level because nobody has any more than anybody else does. So I made the best of it. It's home. Patty Hemmer Weisenberger, Colony Kid. <laughs>